And we believe that connecting all those sectors, it would be something much more powerful than staying in our own uh, bubbles, uh, because we truly believe that connecting people and connecting sectors is the, the best way to, to make creativity even more powerful. Welcome to Global Vid, a podcast about original TV and film productions and its international potential. I'm your host, Eric Y. LaPointe. Let's learn from each other and the experts within our field. So hello, everybody. Welcome to today's episode. We are here today with Anna Cecilia Springfeld from Rio to See. How are you, Anna? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming here. I'm very happy to have you here. So today we're going to talk about a few things. Obviously, we're going to talk about Rio to See, which is an event in Rio de Janeiro. Why don't you introduce yourself and your event? So I'm the coordinator of the curator of the curatorship part. So I take care of the content. It, it is a huge event. It is from the 26th of uh, April until the 1st of May. It comes from an event that it, it was called Rio Content Market. So it, it was born as an audiovisual event. And since 2018, it became a larger event and uh, with a focus on creativity and innovation. So now we also have music, games, innovation itself, neuroscience, sports, and so many other subjects. And when we last spoke, you mentioned that it's very much like the South by Southwest model where there's so many things going on. And obviously innovation marketing is involved. There's the audio visual component to it and now music and, and technology and so many other things. Why was that decision made to, to make Rio to see different than other TV markets? Why just focus in one pillar when you can speak and aggregate so many other sectors and we could make even the audiovisual stronger, connecting audiovisual to other sectors, because um, somehow the visual has been always uh, very encapsulated. And we believe that connecting all those sectors, it would be something much more powerful than staying in our own uh, bubbles, uh, because we truly believe that connecting people and connecting sectors is the, the best way to, to make creativity even more powerful and to promote more talents and to promote also the economy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when you look at entire industries, either even within the entertainment industry, obviously the, the TV industry learned a lot from what happened with the music industry in the early 2000s when things started to go digital. And so now my audience still remains people who are interested in the TV and film industry, or mostly focused on the TV and streaming industries. So why should they come to Rio to see, and what can they expect that's different from, let's say, MIP Cancun and, and NAPI Miami, which are also focused on Latin America? Brazil is a very important market, even globally. We have lots of consumers. If you can uh, just compare to, comparing to Canada, for example, you have around 40 million people. In Brazil, you have more than 200 million people. Yeah, which makes you the sixth largest in the world. Exactly. So we consume a lot. And now we produce a lot as well. Because since, I mean, it's been like three to four years that uh, Netflix, Amazon came to Brazil. So we had already a strong market. But it was, we produced and we consumed internally. It was very hard to export. But with the streamers in Brazil and also having uh, Warner Group Media and all the, the studios from US as well, like Fox that then merged with Disney. Uh, but we have all those US studios in Brazil, plus the streamers, the market got even stronger and we started to produce much more because the demand of local content for by those streamers is huge so not uh, like 10 years ago we created also a law in brazil that obliged all tv channels especially the international tv channels to buy uh, independent production 
series and, and films. And then when the, the streamers came along, we had to produce even more. So we have like nowadays at Ancini, which is our agency, it's a little bit like a CMF in Brazil. We have more than 13 production companies registered. So it's a lot of uh, production companies producing, but even with the streamers that now we are uh, like exporting more because they are all global. So we are living this experience of seeing Brazilian content all over the world. But even though we still need to make partnerships, so it's wonderful if we can have uh, players from all over coming to Brazil to meet Brazilian producers so they can produce together and create co-production treaties and also co-producing even for those streamers that are based in Brazil. So I think it's a great opportunity to find partners in Brazil and to produce and to be consumed in a, in a country that has more than 200 million people. So is it more of a co-production market rather than a buying and sell market? It's both because also in Rio to see besides the conference, we have a market where we have lots of pitching sessions, roundtable meetings, workshops and mentorships, and not just for audiovisual, but also music and innovation. And, but in the audio visual sector, how, how many people would come normally? to Rio to see. I know we just went through two years of, of lockdown, but in the past, how many people would come to the TV component of the, of the event? We have in the, within the market, I, I would say even for this, this edition, we have more than 200 players registered. What I mean by players is channels, streamers, producers, all registered just for the market. For the whole event, we have around 2,000 people circulating. So within the conference, the festival, the summits, and also the market. So it's a lot of people and it's people who are already working in the market. It's not students. It's really just for professionals. And so let's talk about that innovation for a moment. What can TV producers expect to learn something new, right? That goes outside of their comfort zone. I imagine that you're looking at NFTs and the metaverse. What what are the subjects that could be of interest to uh, the audiovisual sector that's, that's more innovative? We've been producing the same way for so many years. And then when the pandemic came, we had to reinvent ourselves and also reinvent process and invent methods. We will have a panel just speaking about that and how producers reinvented themselves and reinvented their businesses. There are so many things that each company had to create in order to keep alive, to, to still work, because uh, especially for developing and post-production, uh, people didn't stop. We, we are going to speak about that in a panel, but we are, going, we are also going to speak about the metaverse and how can you integrate audiovisual and games and music and brands so we have a special uh, room, which, which we call a uh, stage. So we have 10 stages during the event and a special one just for the, the audiovisual that we call screening room. But we also have another one called cyber stage and a new frontier. And that's where we are going to discuss about uh, games, metaverse, NFTs, and not just NFTs in audiovisual, but also in art, in the financial world. So when, how can we put all those things together and how can we make the industry more powerful using the digital uh, tools that are coming up and make people think about it because there is a kind of euphoria <laughs> around the metaverse and we have a speaker called Olivia, Olivia Mirchior, who comes from the fashion world and she says that uh, it's funny because people think that we are going to open a door <laughs> into the metaverse. So that's the kind of thing we want also. It's to make people speak about it and think about it and reflect about where do you want to go with the metaverse? What is the metaverse? What is the metaverse for 
a person like Olivia who comes from the fashion world? What is the metaverse for someone like Fabio Sardo, who is the creative development director of Meta and who, who is actually a Brazilian, but who works for Meta in New York? And um, what is the metaverse for Claudio Lima, who is uh, the CEO of a, a game developer and a game a games agency? So, you know, this different point of views of the same subject. And where are you going? What we want to do with uh, this kind of thing, like the metaverse or the NFTs? We have around three panels on the metaverse. Okay. And each one has a different way of what things can be discussed and who is involved in the discussion so that we can have different points of view and also different approaches? Well, I think it's an important question because at the end of the day, you know, if you, if you look at the history of all media, starting from like the telephone, it, it was always the Wild West in the beginning. And then you have these companies that come in and try to control everything. And the phone companies were the first thing. Even cable was a little bit the Wild West, television, uh, radio, et cetera. And what's fascinating with the metaverse is it barely exists. It exists in pieces. And you, already before it even exists, you have companies like Facebook that want to control it, that want to say, well, no, we are the metaverse. Whereas the I guess the concept of the metaverse is is much like all the media beforehand. It's should be open source. It should be as flexible as possible so that technically you should be able to go from one platform to another and still wear, I don't know, the same shoes or, or virtual clothes that you bought. <laughs> and so let's move to our second topic. I think this is perfect. And, and you know, this, a, this is how I'd like to transition. So I'd like to talk about your personal industry background. Let's tr slowly transition with Rio to see because you've done other events in your career. So when you look at all the other events you've done in the past, compared to Rio to see, is it fun? Do, are you having fun right now with all this innovation? You seem to be smiling all the time when I talk to you about this. <laughs> <laughs> How does it differ from your the early film festivals that you participated in at the start of your career? Somehow um, it translates my whole career, you know, because I've been involved with um, fashion during four years of my life, not just all the visual, and also I'm very much into sports. So it's a very eclectic event, and I'm a very eclectic person. So it's translates a little bit about what I am and what I've been doing for the last 24 years in my career. What I love is that it connects so many things and it makes me look from different point of views and to make synapses all day long <laughs> and it has broadened my view so it's a huge challenge it's a huge challenge and it's been a, a great journey i could say and I, that's what i want people to feel also and to try to get out of the obvious try to 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 try new things and to look at things in a different way so and to be open and i think that uh, if you're open to this process because it is uh, we used to say that as real to see has three phases because the first day is just the summit from the 27th to the 29th it is the conference in the market and during the weekend, which is the, the 30th of April and the 1st of May, there is the festival. So during the conference and the summit, we want to provoke the disruption and to change people's minds. During the festival, we want to help people create a new mind because it's people who are getting to the university or in a transition. So maybe even if it's a 50 years person, but want to, to get into a new uh, position or a new profession. What happened to me, it's what we hope to offer other people. It's to make people think differently and to see other things and to look at the same things in a different way. Can I ask one last question about Rio to see how many countries from around the world are participating? 
at this edition, because, I mean, there is still a lot of restrictions because of COVID, we have around 10 countries. That's, that's still great. And in the past, how many countries would participate? Maybe around 20. We have a lot of people always coming from U.S., we would love to have more Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> we had already during the Rio content before the Rio to see, we had uh, missions from Canada and Canada is a great partner of Brazil, especially for TV productions. Because unfortunately on film, we had just two productions with Canada and with the same producer, mm. with the lovely uh, Ned Fishman that I had the chance to meet in person when I've been to Canada. But it was the, the just the, the only two in co-production with Canada. So I think we deeply need to, to bring more Canadians to Brazil and to partner with you because I've been working with, uh, especially with the CMF in the last four years. And I had the chance to see that we have so much in common. And I would love to see more co-productions between my country and Europe. Yeah. Well, I think it's typically... You know, Canada has something like almost 60 treaties across the world to do co-productions with. But then when you actually peel back the layers, some countries are not so active and it's hard. You know, you, you need to get funding going from both countries. And, and so it's not necessarily an easy feat. So uh, kudos to the people who have managed to do it so far between Canada and Brazil. And yes, I agree. Let's, let's hope for more uh, cooperation between our two countries. Okay, so let's talk about your personal background and how you got started. So uh, we already have a hint right now that you've been involved in the audiovisual sector for uh, quite a while now. And the first thing I saw on your resume, at least of what you posted on LinkedIn, was, was a film festival. How, how did you get started in, in the early days? Well, when I got into college in Brazil, we almost didn't have films being produced. There, there was no industry at that time. And I wanted so much to work with the Brazilian culture abroad. And so I went to the advertising college, which was something that was closer to film. Then my first job was at the Brazilian consulate in Portugal, because Brazil always had a very stereotyped image. And I truly believe that working with the culture, the Brazilian culture abroad would help people understand better what Brazil is and Brazil is so diverse and I'm still trying to understand my own country. So, okay. <laughs> and when I was in this, in this training session in the Brazilian consulate in Portugal, I had the opportunity to connect with a festival in Brazil and it was an international festival. And then when I come back to Brazil, I started working with them and they had a market. It was a small market at that time, and, but it was already my entrance door into this industry. Since then, I, I never stopped. <laughs> it, it made me also look at audiovisual as an industry and as a business. Right. Because I didn't begin looking at film, I mean, as a professional, I didn't begin uh, as a film director, a script writer, I began close to the market. So I just, I, I focus my point of view and my energy on the business part. And it, it, that's interesting that you work for the consulate in Portugal. Is that, am I saying it right? Um, because... When I look at your background, there's this mix of being affiliated on the, you know, tied close, closely tied to the government side, you know, and, and doing things with other countries. And also this kind of an events, of course, and then of course, production. So you, like, what was it about the audiovisual industry that made you go, oh, I, I have to do this? I love the movie image, and I think it's a way to communicate so many things and emotions and stories and characters. So I, and also the thing that is, there is a, something common in every production, but somehow there's always something surprising. So you have the routine, but you also have the surprise. And I love that because I, I couldn't bear 
stay in the same company my whole life. So that's why I also had experiences in so many places. And that was what gave me a 360% point of view because I've been in every chair of this, this ecosystem. So what would you recommend to other people who are starting in the industry? But in your case, there's a, there's a twist to the question. It's like, what would you recommend to people who are starting in the industry, but also maybe in a country where the film or TV industry is not so active? Because as you mentioned, like when you started your career, there wasn't so much of a content industry yet in Brazil or living in, in neighboring countries in, in Latin America, for example, that want to get into the film industry? First, I would say, if you don't want to be uh, creative in this industry, I would say that go to an administration <laughs> course or engineering. I think it helps a lot. If I knew that, I, I, I would have done at the beginning of my career because there are lots of people who study communications and then go to the audiovisual industry and we are not prepared exactly. So I would say that a basis in administration or engineering would do great. I did notice that you have two degrees. You, have, you started with communications and then you moved on to... I studied management because I, I felt that I had to. And because you can learn, I mean, the creative part... In, in a different way, I would say. You can, you can learn from specific courses, but when you go to college, this formal uh, way, to, way of studying, and now I know that it's, everything is so different <laughs> anyway, but in a traditional way, I would say, if you want uh, to work in the film industry as an executive, I would go for administration. It's funny, Anna, because I was, when I was younger, I really wanted to go into... Uh, I wanted to apply for the radio and television degree at Ryerson in, in Toronto, or I was looking at the communication degree in, in Concordia. My parents were a little bit more, no, go the regular route. So either you go in sciences or you go in business management. At that time, kind of got pressured to go into business management, but you're right. It was actually a really good, even though I wasn't, I didn't feel like in the right environment because I was surrounded by people who wanted to be corporate executives. And here I was, I wanted to be in the entertainment industry, but I was learning management. But at the same time, what it taught me is like how to do accounting properly, how to work with spreadsheets and those kind of things. And very similar to the start of our conversation where we we're talking about how we can learn from other industries. If you're only focused on film or music or, you know, some niche of the entertainment industry, you're not learning from other aspects. Uh, and that's the great thing about management school is that you're constantly working on case studies from, could be a chocolate bar company, it could be, could be McDonald's, it could be Coca-Cola, it could be all sorts of different companies and studying what they're doing and how they're doing things differently. And of course, especially with international marketing and sales, that, that applies as well. So you have to do the plug and play by yourself. Yeah, yeah. You go to the management school, even being a second degree, and you start to, to look at what can really function. How do you put those two knowledge together? Because it's hard sometimes. As things are being really different, in the last, last years and also uh, colleges and uh, universities, they are changing their programs and they are bringing more uh, management knowledge into the creative programs. I think that maybe in the near future, we'll re really have a course that can bring those things together because the manage managerial part we will understand that entertainment is such a powerful industry that they have to look at it. And also the entertainment industry understands that we need to have more uh, management knowledge. So we have to put those, those things together. And when we are working in this industry, it's, I think it's easier to, to understand what is missing. Yeah. And what you have too much now that we have to deal with data all the time. 
how do you transform data into knowledge? And how do you balance data and the human elements? And it's, of course, linked to your repertoire. You, you what you know from film, what you know from the narratives. So you have to balance. This is something that is very challenging nowadays. You have to balance this knowledge of management and data with the knowledge of the creative part, the, the scripts, and also how to, to create narratives that can engage people. So you have to develop so many abilities and competences. It's, it's such a challenge. But really, at the end of the day, you, you had to learn on the job because now you've got, gained all that management experience. And I think I went through the same thing. I started my career in, in the music industry, by the way, which is interesting that Rio2C includes music. But everything I did, I had to learn on my own because it wasn't being taught in school. So could you talk to me a little bit about those first steps? And maybe actually we could talk about, because you've done production, right? You've been involved on yes. that side of things. So as you started doing the creativity of reviewing the scripts, what was the hardest part? How did you do it? Um, I had a great mentor. And it was funny because at that time I was trying to work with a company that was so much into art films. And suddenly I had this opportunity of working with this producer that uh, actually became one of the greatest producers in Brazil, especially when you speak about results, about blockbusters. And he was someone from the advertising uh, industry and who was very much into music as well. Okay. And he wanted to create films. He said, I don't create films or produce films for myself, but for the audience. And when I got into this company, I was like, I don't, I'm not sure if I want to, to produce those films. He used to produce like five features a year. Wow. That's so uh, in four years, I had the chance to participate in the development, financing, production, and releasing of uh, almost 20 features. I knew and I, I, I learned about every step of the production, and that gave me a, a lot of um, experience because it was so so many features in so uh, such a short period of time. It was really working with him that I learned and that, and that, I, and that and I had this, uh, also I developed this ability of dealing with creators and also financiers because he used to work a lot with uh, major studios like Warner, uh, Fox, Sony, so I learned from the agreements and the, all the contracts and also hiring the talents and also distributing the films, but it was really working, working with him. I learned really, really a lot. So just, you know, find your mentor, <laughs> <laughs> find your mentor and be open. I was just about to ask, is that your advice? Because that sounds... That sounds like a great one. And it's not always easy to find a good mentor. I've had many, many mentors in my life. N never one that stuck around lo long enough, but I've learned from all of them for sure. I I've learned for so many mentors. Dealer was the, the really someone really important in my life. But then in each company that I worked, there was someone open to, to, to share their knowledge. And I was eager to learn from them. So... You'll have to share this podcast with them after <laughs> to, to say thank you. <laughs> so oh, that, I think this is a perfect transition to our third and final topic, which is getting projects finance. And now I'm curious, 20 years ago, how did somebody start financing five films in one year? And how has that evolved in the 2000s and 2010s in Brazil? It was and it still is uh, through incentive laws. We have an incentive law called the audiovisual law, where each any company that pay, has to pay taxes to our, our government can use part of this, this taxes to invest in a film or in a series. 
and also all those major studios, uh, international companies based in Brazil, when they have to send their money abroad, if for example, Spider-Man, it's a huge success in Brazil, and then you have to transfer the money of the box offices to the company in US, part of the tax that it is you have to pay to transfer the money you can use to invest in local productions okay so that's how dealer this this producer with whom i worked he produced the the five features a year he got together with the studios like fox warner sony buena vista and the biggest part of the, the budgets were financed by those companies because they also wanted to have something in Brazil that connected with the Brazilian audience. So that's how we used to, to finance in Brazil like from the last 20 years ago. But 10 years ago, we had a new, uh, new law that, that was focused on TV and that obliged the channels, the cable channels, to invest in independent production uh, works. At, at that time, we really started to produce much more because we used to produce like a uh, hundred feature films a year. Yeah. But it was just for film. And then when this law came along, we started to produce a lot for TV. And then in the last four or five years, the streamers came. And the streamers, they do not use the incentive loss. They give private money. But at the same time, we have to give up our intellectual properties because they have it all. So when we use an incentive law, you can keep your rights. And all those companies who can uh, finance your work, they can keep up to 49% of your rights. If you work with the streamers, then you shall leave 100% for them. So yep. it's a different business model, but at the same time, it came in a, in a moment that was crucial for Brazilian producers because in the last three years, the money that came from the government or from our own industry through a fund called the Sectorial Fund it was very hard to have this money because the agency that regulates the, this money um, had problems. So we had just one pillar responsible for the financing in Brazil. And when this pillar got uh, like frozen, then the streamers came along and they substituted the way we finance our films and series. So it came in a good time. Nowadays, we finance films and series through public money okay. through this incentive loss or private money through the streamers. The, the channels and the distributors, they can also invest uh, private money. But when they have public money, sometimes it's easier and you have less risk. Does the local TV industry, private channels like Globo, are they threatened by the streamers coming in? That's true that for many years, Globo was almost by uh, itself. And now uh, there are competitors, strong competitors with a lot of money and investing in local productions. But for producers and creators, it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> so other than Netflix and Amazon, who else is coming to Brazil? We are still waiting for Hulu. Okay. We have Paramount. We have Paramount in Brazil, but Paramount also uh, produces for Netflix, and so they are partners. We have Warner Media, who is also with HBO Max in Brazil and investing a lot as well, private money, not just using. They use also incentive loss, but they are using a lot of private money. And a lot of these studios, they've been in Brazil for a long time now. Yes, Disney and Warner and HBO, even before uh, being together, they, they were already working in Brazil and produce, co-producing a lot. But now they are making much, much more. Are there any tax credits? We're trying to, and Sao Paulo, they created a dispositive that it's a bit like in Canada. Actually, they, they had been with uh, Sodec, 
and with Ontario Creates in order to understand how did you operate. And they released this kind of tax credit in Sao Paulo, but it's this, the, the only state now. We have like regional laws, also not just federal laws and municipal laws. So from the city and from the state, and we have incentive laws from the state and also from the city and also from the countries. That's good because that mixes it up, especially if for some reason, if there's, you know, if there are issues right now with the agency and they're not giving out as much money as they used to, then at least there's provincial or, or state jurisdictions and municipal ones that might support the, uh, yeah. the filmmaking industry, basically trying to attract the filmmaking in their in their areas, in their regions. Exactly. Well, Anna, it has been a pleasure to have you with me today on this podcast. I really appreciate your time. And I wish you much, much success with Rio2C as you come back post pandemic. So have a great event. And let's continue uh, sharing the, your event to the world so that uh, you'll, you'll have an even bigger audience in 2023 and beyond. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Eric. And I hope to have, as I said, more Canadians in Brazil and people from all over to visit our country and to get to know uh, our creators and executives who work uh, within the entertainment industry. Well, it certainly sounds a lot like fun. Thank, Thank you so much. You. And that concludes today's Global Vid podcast. Thanks to our guest, Anna Cecilia Springfeld of Rio2C, our editor, Nicole Almeida, and our theme song composers, Amber Goodwin and Aaron Ross. And if you've made it this far, please feel free to drop us a comment or like, subscribe to our show, and share with your friends. See you next time.